key US inflation data meets expectations, leaving the Fed on track to cut in September rather than later this week. The Bank of Japan is expected to hike on Wednesday, while the Bank of England is seen holding this week. New Zealand consumer confidence bounces. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ senior commodity strategist Daniel Hines digs into the demand and supply issues, hammering iron ore prices lower. It does look like we've got a perfect storm in a sense, which could certainly weigh on prices even further than what we've seen just recently due to those ongoing issues with the Chinese property sector. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, US personal consumption expenditure inflation figures, the Fed's key measure, came out on Friday night and they were in line with expectations. They allowed global stocks to keep rebounding from that slump earlier in the week. Core PCE rose 0.2% in June from May and was up 2.6% from a year ago. Here's ANZ head of FX research, Marja Ben Zaman, who says the surprisingly low May figure of 0.08% was revised up to 0.13%. But that doesn't change the outlook. This is still quite favourable and easily below the rate consistent with Fed's 2% analysed inflation target. So broadly, the rough trend of disinflation after a strong Q1 series really does still hold. Q2 averaged around 0.2% month on month after an average of about 0.4% in Q1. The S&P 500 closed up 1.1% and the Nasdaq was up 1%, while the two-year and 10-year US Treasury yields were flat. The Aussie and Kiwi opened this week's trading flat at 65.49 US cents and 58.89 US cents respectively as of 4am Sydney Melbourne time. Number two, markets will be focused this week on three major central bank decisions. The Bank of Japan on Wednesday afternoon, the Fed's FOMC on Thursday morning, Sydney Melbourne time, and the Bank of England on Thursday night. Most in the market don't expect the FOMC to cut this week. September is seen as the jumping off point for the start of the Fed's cutting cycle. Here's ANZ Group Chief Economist Richard Yitzinger on the chances of a Fed cut this week. There is some chance the FOMC eases this meeting. Maybe some of the recent gyrations in markets kind of will nudge them in that direction, but you'd put well less than 50% probability on it. There, uh, I think it's much more likely that the Fed just allows a little bit more time to be confident of the inflation pulse, to be confident that the activity side of the economy has slowed sufficiently for inflation to be consistent with target, and then we get the first rate cut in September. Number three. Then there's the Bank of Japan on Wednesday. It is expected to hike, yes, hike, by 15 basis points to, wait for it, 0.25%. It's all the more important after a surge in the yen last week possibly on intervention by Japan's authorities. Here's Marjabin. All eyes on Bank of Japan this week. Uh, we expect Bank of Japan to raise its policy rate by 15 basis points to 25 basis points at its meeting on Wednesday. Uh, we also expect another 25 basis points hike in October. Of course, quantitative tightening is also likely to be a feature as well. Now, Services PMI in Japan improved in July, rising quite a bit, and this kind of indicates that growth is holding up. Services input prices also increased along with many other indicators that we've been seeing, including the CPI and PPI, which I guess would give some comfort to the BOJ to consider raising rates. Number four, the Bank of England decides on Thursday night whether to cut. Here's Richard. We think it's premature for the Bank of England to ease it at this meeting. Wage growth is still between 5 and 6%. It's coming down. It's moving in the right direction, but still not there. Non-tradable inflation, as with everywhere, has been quite high. It's moving in the right direction, but is still not coming down sufficiently in our view. So we're certainly, from a probabilistic perspective, more comfortable with the idea that the Bank of England doesn't move this meeting, although, of course, we expect the Fed not to move either. Number five. In New Zealand on Friday, ANZ Roy Morgan's survey of consumer confidence in July found a bounce, albeit from very low levels. Here's Richard. The pattern in New Zealand has been for consumers to say things were much worse than the business sector, and that has started to tilt back the other way. A bit of a recovery in consumer confidence as inflation has come down, and that's been a common theme across economies. But as monetary policy has worked, its policy effort, I was going to say magic, I don't know that many people would view it that way, as monetary policy has delivered what it's meant to and the economy has slowed, uh, it's business confidence that has been coming down late in the cycle. So this will be an important signal, I think, or validation of the idea in New Zealand. The activity side of the economy is slowing quite sharply and we're getting closer towards the first rate cut. Our view is November. Markets, as they always do, is speculating it could well be earlier than that. 
Richard Yetzinger there. Now, in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ senior commodity strategist Daniel Hines looks at the demand and supply issues that are pushing iron ore prices lower. He explains why he has cut his iron ore price view down to $100 US a tonne in a recent research note. It looks like these typical seasonal headwinds are starting to pick up, uh, which could potentially push the price even lower. Namely being steel demand uh, tends to peak in China um, around uh, May or June. And then as the summer months come in, construction activity slows down. And so we're faced with a seasonal downturn coming up. But at the same time, we're we're seeing a recovery in supply. And a lot of listeners might have heard about the issues that BHP and Rio had, for example, um, in the first quarter due to weather the related issues, mainly cyclones coming through WA. They've now recovered from those and they're starting to pick up their output uh, just at that time when demand starts to uh, fall away. So it does look like we've got um, perfect storm in a sense, which could certainly weigh on prices even further than what we've seen just recently due to those um, ongoing issues with uh, the Chinese property sector. I see you've uh, reduced your price target for iron ore down to $100 a tonne, but not necessarily below that for long. Yeah, look, I think um, for us, um, the downside is somewhat limited because of the longer term structural decline in supply growth. These uh, major diversified miners um, have essentially put a lot of those projects on the back burner once they envisage steel demand starting to weaken in in China. And so we're seeing uh, very little growth over the next few years. So as a result, I think the market's actually going to stay relatively well balanced on that sort of medium to, to long term view. But certainly in the shorter term, you can get the these dislocations, I suppose, which can certainly push prices a bit below where you see the fundamental support level being. Um, And for us, you know, $100 looks fair over the next uh, year or so, but certainly um, in the shorter term, I think there's a distinct possibility if we continue to see um, um, a seasonal downturn in demand in China with that growth in supply, then we could potentially see prices below that for a short period. There's uh, one extraordinary chart in your uh, commodity call note showing the explosive rebound in iron ore exports uh, from Australia since the beginning of the year. Could you give us some specific examples of where there's been not just a recovery from existing projects, but new projects coming in? We had these operations running at full capacity through 2022. um, And when there's suddenly um, a sudden supply disruption happens and we saw um, train derailments, we saw ports being closed because of cyclones, things like that. The uh, the fall away can be quite quick, but they can rebound once those things disappear. And that's what we're seeing now. But we have also seen some other additional sources come through, Fortescue bringing in a new operation and certainly the big majors as well, um, you know, closing out old pits but replacing them with newer ones. The Chinese property market, the conventional one at least, is not rebounding in any great way. And you make the point about intensity of steel use being different for social housing rather than regular commercial dwellings. Could you talk a bit more about that, given that the authorities in China seem to be keen on social housing? It's been an important part of the recent measures that they've uh, introduced to stabilise the market. So a lot of state-owned enterprises are now in task with uh, building out that uh, social housing program um, and uh, they will utilise a lot of the unfinished or unsold inventory that's sitting in China at the moment. So as a consequence, um, the steel use is is significantly lower. And so we're going to see a shift over the next five to 10 years where the steel intensity of use going into the property sector is going to decline because of that real focus on social housing. That's an issue which you know, a lot of the industry, including the, the diversified miners, had been focused on in recent times and is why they're pulling back from some of those larger projects that they had in the pipeline not too long ago. Daniel Hines, there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Monday, July the 29th. Look out tomorrow for a closer look at what a President Trump might mean for global inflation and interest rates. This podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.